Um, we're going to move swiftly on uh, to the next panel, uh, where we're going to start future, future gazing a bit. No doubt uh, Google will have some part in that future as well. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Gerd Leonard uh, from MediaFuturist.com. So give him a round of applause and uh, let's get start future gazing. Okay. All right, this is on. Okay, hello. Don't worry, I'm not going to speak again. You already had the pleasure yesterday. I have two better speakers to offer you today. Two real futurists, chief utopians, cyber professors, as alleged yesterday. So we have some great people with us. I want to introduce today David Smith. Would you come up, David? David is, uh, comes from the GFF, the Global Futures Forum. And in this session, we're going to show you some models of the future, some ideas about the broader future, not just music. Uh, David has been in business for 30 years in IT and services, uh, used to be with Unisys. Uh, his company does futurist research. That seems like an oxymoron, but it's actually both. It's research and the future. Uh, he's consulted on uh, very many major brands, and uh, his presentation is going to kick your butt. I'm fairly sure on that, so hand it over to okay. you. Okay, thank you very much, Good. Good afternoon. I want to talk um, quite quickly, if I may, uh, and for about 10 minutes, about some aspects of the future that we think may have some impact in your world. Um, I want to turn the, uh, the lens around for a moment and really just look at uh, the people, because I think you know, fundamentally the things that are driving change around the world is not just technology and power moving east and all those sort of big issues, but people, we, us, we are changing our minds about our aspirations, our way of life, etc. So the title, Changing Society, um, is the sort of beginning of the journey, then it's sort of changing technology that overlaps that. Then, of course, there are implications that I've been hearing about for the last two days, which about changing business, changing business models, monetization, what business practices should you have in place, who owns the copyright, who owns the, the, the artist, who owns the distribution. So all of those issues are, are very much alive in this industry, for sure. I've, I've experienced that. Now, Gerd used this quote yesterday, but I want to take this quote and use it further, if I may. Um, essentially, uh, if we look at the future, and believe it or not, we, we use the same tools to investigate the future as we use to investigate history. And as we learn more about the future, we refine our view. Uh, and that's the same about investigating the past. The more we learn about the past, we refine our view about the way that it was. Uh, but here, if you relied on experts, and I don't cast myself in the role of expert, but if we took an expert view, uh, Lord Kelvin would have said here that, you know, heavier than air flying machines are impossible, x-rays will turn out to be a hoax. Uh, and radio has no future. Now, if you'd applied that to your business, you wouldn't have done terribly well. So how did it turn out? OK, well, we did invent heavier-than-air flying machines. And when we did, the Boeing engineer on the launch of this 10-seater said there will never be a larger aircraft made. And of course, now we see the latest iteration on Emirates Airlines of the A380 Airbus with 1,000 seats. I mean, can you imagine baggage reclaim on one of those? The key practice about this is that we're very poor at seeing new horizons. We often think we've arrived at a destination because we live in a project-oriented world, and we're not. We're actually experiencing a piece of change on the planet that happens to be the piece we're experiencing. We come into it, we move through it, and it moves on. So nothing is going to stand still. That's good news for some people, and it's challenging for others. Let's take another example. We looked at radio. Now, when first people started muting the idea that TV might have a place in society and distribution, uh, in the US, in the New York Times, they said no one would ever have the time, surely, to look at a device. The radio is going to remain king. Well, you can imagine what happened then. Of course, we now have these dominant machines that are in our rooms, our lives. Everywhere now, we're surrounded with TV. And that, I think, is a huge clue as to what's going to happen in terms of technology uh, for the future. So again, we, we got it wrong. We couldn't think over that horizon. Now, the last thing I want to talk about in this segment is tomato ketchup. You know, it may not seem terribly relevant, but nonetheless, tomato ketchup came in this iconic bottle. What was wrong with that bottle? What was wrong with that delivery method? It didn't work. You know, fundamentally, it didn't work, but it was so attached to the brand and the value and the perception and the distribution and the marketing that it was kept for quite a long time. Now, eventually, they did studies and found out that people turned it upside down and kept it in their cupboard. So what did they do? They put a big flat lid on it so that you could stand it on its head. Now, if you look very closely at the innovation, actually, what they've done is they've turned the label over. 
Now, that's a big step, isn't it? Okay, now they came out with that in 1872, and 130 years later they fixed the problem. <laughs> now, it's very easy when we're poking fun at Heinz, and Heinz are one of my clients, and they know I talk about this. They didn't think it was funny when I put it to them. They just thought, yes, it took 130 years. The problem is, in our industries, we find it extraordinarily hard to change ourselves. We see things the way they're always done, and we find it hard to think of any possible way of doing it differently. And I think, in many ways, that's where the music industry is at today. So the question for the industry, and the question for you, and to share amongst your colleagues is, you know, what's your tomato ketchup bottle in your world? What, what are your, your listeners, your fan base, and I hate the idea of calling them consumers, uh, what are they telling you they want to do with your music? There are a mass of global trends, and if I had a bit longer, I'd talk to these, because all these trends are impacting the way we want to live our lives. We're living longer lifestyles. We know now that there's a chance of most people in this room probably live to about three or 400 years. Now, even if you don't believe that, imagine it's 120 or 140. You know, walking in here this afternoon, you may have bought another 40 or 50 years to live. And what I never can cease to fail to, to understand is most people groan at that idea. But we've got a very different perspective of how life's going to be going forward. And of course, technology is changing. The power and position of, of companies and businesses and governments is moving around the world. All of that is having a big impact on our lives and how we want to run those lives. Now, I want to talk to you about a company that did quite well in changing. And I would say probably challenging many of us in the room about how we face change. There was a company once that ran a paper mill, a paper pulping plant, and ultimately some of the use of that paper was, was toilet paper, which is why I like this amusing image. They then went on to make telegraph cable, and you imagine there isn't much in similar between paper, paper pulping and distribution and uh, uh, telegraph, except they thought that was the future of the time. And then finally they turned themselves into Nokia, the mobile handset company. How many of your companies have gone through three industries and still survived and become preeminent? Almost no companies convert from one industry to another. Almost none survive. We find it extremely hard to change, but change nonetheless we must. And if you listened to Nokia yesterday, you, the conversation was not about handsets, the conversation was about content. So the good news is to content owners, everybody here is talking about content. Everybody at other conferences I go to outside the music industry are talking about content and service. So, let's talk about somebody else, EA Games. EA Games make the uh, FIFA soccer game. They were being pirated to death. They were making $1 million at the peak a month for their game. And they were about to give up. And somebody came into the boardroom and said, I know what we'll do, let's give it away. Now, how successful do you think that person's career was after that? Well, they said, let's give it away. So what they did, they give it away, but they surrounded themselves with a network of people who would make upgrades and enhancements for the game. So the game was given away, but they had all of these micro players around them distributing upgrades and new shirts and new football strips and player enhancements. They're now making $2 million a day on this game, a month on this game. So they're making twice as much money because they gave their product away. So in many ways, there are good examples out there for actually understanding that the money has moved on the things that we're prepared to spend our, our money on. The internet, as you've heard over these days, is opening up all sorts of opportunities, mashups in particular, where we drive information from different sources to create a unique offer to meet people's needs. And the one thing, if you look at Porter's Five Forces, that there used to be a time when the suppliers were in charge of markets. It's now pretty dominant across many different markets. The consumers, the customers, the users have the power in this model and in many of the models that we're working with today. And in understanding that, tells you what we should be doing. What's equally interesting recently is innovation to get out of mass markets, to be differentiated, to make money. Innovation is becoming absolutely key and vital to going forward. I want to talk about two other industries, if I may, because it's much easier sometimes to look at other people and their problems. A few years ago in Bain & Co, who are a very well-respected organisation, a consultancy, they looked at grocery and looked at online grocery and said, this is going nowhere. This will be nowhere in five years. In the UK, for example, now Tesco's just alone have 300,000 orders a week. And the marketed sector rise by 20% a year. How much would you like a market to rise 20% a year? And again, this was fought by many people. And many people struggled with the new models. And many people burnt cash. These folk burnt about 300 million pounds in the first four years trying to get this business going. It's now highly profitable and becoming even more profitable and central to their business proposition. 
Let's look at internet banking. Internet banking, for example, in 2000, was said by The Economist that why has it not delivered the promise that it held for all of us to have banking online? And you may remember WAP banking for the mobile community, which put off bankers returning to mobile banking for a half a decade, simply because WAP, which was online permanently, was a terrible solution. But nonetheless, we've gone beyond that now. We're seeing, uh, in the UK at least, 500% increase in the number of internet adult users doing online banking in the last seven years. How much would you like to have a market that's grown 500% in the last seven years? So it's very hard when we're at the beginning of something or we feel we're in the middle of something to foresee how it's going to turn out. And the last one, I guess, is the travel industry. And this one's really interesting because the travel industry across the world, and we do quite a bit of work in the travel world, are really challenged about what is the purpose of a travel agent. How do you position a travel agency now, given access to online services where people are commenting? What's interesting now is consumer-generated comment, TripAdvisor. How many of you use TripAdvisor? Yeah. What do you do when you come across a bad comment on a hotel? Do you look for more or do you move on to someone else? Well, very often we move on to somebody else. And what's really interesting about that is that we don't know who they are. They could be lying. They may, they may have made it up. But we like peer-to-peer -peer connection. And all we've been hearing about social networks is incredibly powerful. And I know, you know my next speaker in this, in this segment will go on and talk a little bit more about people and, and why we're so important and how we behave. I could talk about automotive, we're talking about new engine plants, whether it's electricity, whether it's uh, hydrogen cell. You know, we're looking for alternate solutions, and that's gutting the industry in terms of the investment that's required to get that out into the marketplace. Airlines, notwithstanding those that go into the Hudson, most of them fly and get there in one bit, are looking at the environmental impact. Are people really going to be challenged by that and stop flying? And I'm not going to go through those one by one, but banking is being hollowed out by the prospect of Zopa-like services where people lend money and borrow money from other people, peer-to-peer. -peer. We can do banking without banks, and quite frankly, we're not going to have many banks, are we? So there's an awful lot of change in an awful lot of industries going through the same thing. I would just encourage you to, to get understanding about where they're at in their world and how they got through some of these new models. Technology is allowing us to connect and collaborate, which is the thing we've been hearing about. People love to connect with each other. I mean, you're here together in a physical presence because we're connecting at the same time as we're listening, as we're being entertained. We're connecting and networking and doing business and hopefully having fun as well at the same time. We also like to personalise, so you're choosing what you go to, who you listen to, etc. There's a whole bunch of things that technology enables us to do and will continually enable us to do going forward. As I said earlier, um, the next big thing as far as I'm concerned in terms of across all technology is vi video. T IPTV, Internet Protocol Television, is going to be such a bust, it's probably going to flatten the internet as we know it. We're talking about trillions of dollars of underinvestment that isn't in place right now to allow us to download and to manipulate video, if you like, images, TV online. And that'll change the way that we want to interact with TV forever. It no longer will be a one-way, single-direction tool that we've become used to looking at. Another one that's fascinating, I think, is outside technology. We're starting to see animated posters now, aren't we? But we're not seeing many interactive, animated, outside posters. So we're about to see a huge revolution. And these, th these pictures, by the way, came out of a sales catalogue. They're not from some futurist, futurist artist studio. You can buy these things now, and they're interactive. So if you want to talk to your fan base, that's fine. But if you want to attract new people to you, you want to go out where the people are, these sorts of devices are going to be fantastic for connecting with, with people and interacting, sampling your music, knowing where the next gig's on, maybe even moving towards booking a ticket, although I don't know how much financial transaction you'll want to do in the street. But effectively, you've got an opportunity to interact with people on a huge scale. And finally, of course, I could just as easily be a hologram, rather than having to travel here, and holograms are going to be a great clue. I've heard monetization about concerts is a vital element now, looking forward. Well, if you've got an artist and you can holographically put them into 50 stadiums around the world on the same evening, that's 50 times the revenue, potentially. So there's all sorts of technologies that are going to allow you to play with the core asset that you've, be, you've built up. We heard from Mr. Park yesterday talking about the investment in people, multiple languages so that they can engage in communities. So these sorts of technologies are fine. And finally, robots. This robot on the right, which, by the way, you can hire this robot for $5,000. Has 104 servo motors, speaks four languages, 
dances, sings, moves around, is virtually uh, indistinguishable from some types of human beings. Not all, I might add. Nonetheless, robotics is going to be a big issue. So finally, in the last half minute, is um, you're in an industry where you're building your customer base on the planet by about 1 billion people every 12 years. That's the rate at which we're growing. Uh, you know, 40 years ago, we, we were 3 billion less people, and in 40 years' time, there'll be 4 billion more. You know, what's the problem? Fantastic opportunity. You've got 8 billion more people to sell to in 80 years. It, it's a great opportunity. So expecting things to remain the same in that mass explosion of a market, 800% more customers, you know, is pretty unreasonable. So there's an opportunity that's on a scale we've never seen before. Finally, just as my last slide, I want to talk about sharing, collaborating, and interacting with those assets is going to be a key feature of the future. We've heard it said before, but they are, they are drivers that we've been tracking now for four and five and six years. They're very strong drivers of our behavior. We want to interact with whatever service, whatever utility, whatever entertainment, we want that interactivity. Equally, we want to uh, play along. So Guitar Hero gives you a clue how we want to interact with our music as well, collectively across the internet with other players, jamming together on those sorts of playful tools. Playing has become now the number one sport in the UK, just overtaking soccer and fishing. So our playfulness tells us how we want to interact with some things. Finally, following other people we've heard about, virtual reality is just going to be awesome when you, when you can really get into the full-blown immersion without daft headsets like this but real sleek headsets that you can get into that world, into that rock concert, and be part of it. Or maybe your star can get out into the community and talk to others are going to be very, very important. Finally, service and purpose for the industry. Getting back to what are consumers, what are customers, what are listeners really after is going to be vital to sort out the distribution and the structure. So think co-creation, think co-distribution, if you like, going forward. Thank you very much. Wow, that was even faster than my own presentation. Well done. All right, so I want to bring up Mark Earls. Okay, Mark Earls is also known as the Herd Meister. He wrote a book called The Herd, his third book. He comes from the advertising business, a former executive at Ogilvy. Okay, and if you want to know more about Mark, you go to uh, herd.typehead.com, that's his blog. And he has some great stuff prepared for you, so enjoy and uh, take it away. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for hanging around to this very last session of the afternoon. Um, uh, I'm going to fess up a couple of things. Number one, I can't tell you what the future is precisely going to be like. As Niels Bohr, the uh, famous physicist, said, the future, predicting the future is really difficult, particularly about the future. The second thing is that I'm not an expert in the music industry. I work with a number of industries, uh, uh, television, and I work with uh, television, marketing, toiletries, entertainment, but I don't yet work with the music industry. But I wouldn't even, with my clients in those worlds, describe myself as an expert in their industries, because I'm an expert in one thing and one thing only, which is people. And I believe that people are the things that are going to change and shape how the future turns out. And it struck me, listening to conversations over the last 24 hours, that this industry doesn't talk that much about people. You're not alone in doing so. A number of others, financial services are another one that doesn't talk much about people. But I think if you started to talk more about people and understand some of the things that are being learnt about people and how and why they do things, you can begin to identify real opportunities for shaping the future profitably. The first of all, I wanted to tell you about um, a particular so I'll tell you a little story about my friend Christine. Now, Christine is a lovely girl, but for much of her adult life, she's been, been unable to get a date on Valentine's night. And so it was on Valentine's, February the 14th, uh, 1989, when um, Michel Platini brought the French team to play at Arsenal, at Highbury in North London, where I live. She was there in the stands, along with 24,000 other people. Now, what was curious about that night was that, uh, at the time, Arsenal, let me explain, didn't have a French manager, didn't have half the French squad in the side, and they basically viewed France as as far away and exotic as could be. But within 30 minutes, the entire crowd were singing a song in French. 
There were no hymn sheets, there were no song sheets, there was no briefing beforehand when someone said, right everyone, before we start, let's just... No, they were singing a song in French. It was like a song they knew already, the same tune, and it meant the same, and they were basically singing Qui est le bastard, excuse the bad North London French, Qui est le bastard dans le noir, who's the bastard in the black, which soccer crowds around the world shout at the referee whenever a decision goes against them. But they did it, they organised themselves. There was no one from the outside making them do it, and they loved doing it, and they did it again and again and again and again. We see this kind of uh, desire to do stuff together in every aspect of human life. And here's another one. This illustration is courtesy of someone I admire greatly, uh, Professor Dirk Helbing, who's teaching in Switzerland now, uh, who studies mass behaviour. Uh, and uh, in particular, he's got one strand of uh, his collaborators who, who go around the world looking at soccer stadiums and seeing how this Mexican wave, as we call it in English, or La Ola in Spanish, or The Wave in American English, Vela, how that spreads around stadiums. And then they do a, a mathematical version of that. Um, and that's what the illustration is. Now, this requires quite a deal, a, gr a great, great deal of sophistication. It's really hard to get individual robots to do this in the way that human beings do. And that tells us something really important about who we are as a species. We are a, cre a social creature, first, foremost, and last. We'd like to think, of course, of all of us, and I'm sure this is how you describe your own life, as you're independent thinkers. You do what you do because you just think it's the right thing to do and you don't follow the crowd. Well, Daniel Kahneman, who won the Nobel Prize for Economics a couple of years ago, said human beings are to independent thinking as cats are to swimming. That is, they can do it if they really have to, but will do almost anything to avoid it. Did you know you have 200,000 miles of synaptic connections in your head, and about half of those are used to watch what other people are doing? Literally. The size of our neocortex, the frontal brain, the thing that we think is to do with thinking, is this thing is actually being shaped through evolution according to the group size and the complexity of relationships we have. We are, as a species, designed to be with other people. Other people is the number one thing that shapes our behaviour. This is what I refer to as the herd revolution. And so, as an industry, you could do well to remember this original truth about the stuff that you're producing. It exists in this context, the context of other people, between people, not individual people paying for downloads, but between people. It always has done, and it always will. And uh, this, I think, gives us a bit of a clue as to what we might do in the future. So the first thing is, first thing is, let's stop thinking about the consumer, somebody out there who pays for stuff as the prime thing. People exist. Not, we're talking about people, and people exist in social context, and always have done, always will do. What people see other people doing is what shapes their behaviour. I don't know if in your hotel bathroom you had a little card which said, if you'd like to leave this on the floor, then we'll replace it, but if you prefer to save the planet, then please hang it up on the rack for the towel. Now, a recent study has shown that that has a 25% greater impact on people's behaviour if it says, and most of the other guests in the hotel are also hanging it up on the rack. So that's just one indication. You know from Amazon what other people say, what other people are doing, has a significant in increase in people's behaviour. Without us realising it, Amazon quote up to 45% increase. And that's why they have 16 different product features on every product page which flip other people's data and show you what's doing. We need to start thinking as an industry, first of all, about people as social creatures and what we do between them. Secondly, about how we can get them to influence themselves. And thirdly, and I think this is really, really important, we need to see what we, the value we create, the value we can get money for, is between them. They want to play with stuff. There is their social value that, that really matters to us. Now, one of the things that we can do, and, and, and David just touched on this, is to give them stuff to do together. They love that, and they'll do it anyway, whether we like it or not, I suspect. And uh, another thing we can do, and this we're seeing around the world, is to give people something to believe in. If you think of the economic climate right now, when you show that you're after money in a transaction, 
as opposed to giving people something of real value to gather around that makes their world seem different, then um, the transaction is the relationship is entirely different. This is a cartoon from my friend Hugh McLeod, who blogs at gapingvoid.com. Businesses, Apple, brands, that you, things like Unilever's Dove, are starting, and, and apparel brands like Howie's and Patagonia and Timberland, these businesses are starting to say, what are, you, what are we for? What are we going to change in the world on your behalf, customers, to make your world that you can gather around? What can you sign up to? IKEA, Greenpeace, and as you move towards the social activism end, you'll see that this is more and more important. Indeed, you might say that this one campaign that dominated so much of, of everyone's world last year, and has got, its, I guess, its culmination on Tuesday this week, was all about giving people something to believe in, giving them stuff to do together, helping them see each other. That's the kind of success that we'd all like to enjoy for our business, and we need to learn from those kind of organisations. So at the end of the day, whilst, again, I've heard a lot of talk about assets and money, and even last night someone was saying to me, it's all about the music. So it wasn't just about money, but the assets and, and the music stuff, maybe it's all about that stuff to you guys right now. But in the future, it's going to have to be about people, which I believe is where music started. Anyway, thank you very much. Much. Thank you very much, Mark. That was fantastic. I think this is a great way to end the futurizing or the presentizing of our discussions. So we have co-creation and co-distribution and something to believe in. Now, I believe we're out of time. So thanks very much. Give a big hand to our speakers. And we're going to go on to the next session, right? Okay, thank you very much. We're out of time. Um, thanks very much for that. That's fascinating.